Welcome to um, this episode in uh, the Coffee Science series of, uh, of our uh, podcast. And um, this episode is the first time I have a guest commenting on my very long um, science uh, episodes uh, where I'm trying to really map out how I think science should be used and, and how I often think it, it is misused. And um, I'm really excited to have uh, Samu Smerke um, on, on as the first guest because uh, you know what you're doing, both when it comes to coffee and science. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited that, you, that you've taken, uh, carved out the time to be, uh, be part uh, of this uh, uh, podcast episode. Um, so we'll talk about uh, Samu's background and also then we'll discuss um, uh, the things that uh, Samu thought uh, when he heard uh, the podcast, both positive and negatives. So um, welcome, and uh, I'm really excited to have you here, Samu. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Morten, for inviting me to, to discuss and talk with you about coffee science. And I'm really, I'm really pleased, I'm really honored to, to be able to talk on this podcast. I think it's a great opportunity for the coffee community to learn a bit more how we scientists think about the experiments that we are doing in coffee, right? Yeah. And um, for me, all this goes back to, you know, maybe I should, I should introduce where my background is. Yes, please. I'm, um, by training, I'm an analytical chemist. So it means that I did a PhD, in, I did a um, university diploma in chemistry and then a PhD in analytical chemistry. So it means that my training was understanding uh, measurements of chemical components in uh, different samples. Uh, so I was in particular working already before with plant extracts and polyphenols, tannins in plant extracts. Uh, so it means this kind of analytical chemistry gives you a critical thinking about uh, methodology that you're using uh, to know is what I see really true? Um, is this the real thing that I want to see? And how do I separate different effects from different uh, variables that I'm observing? And so a lot of these things are very much related to, to, to coffee, you know, directly this kind of um, things that I was doing already in, in, in my you know, very fundamental studies before my coffee time, that is. Yeah, um, and I think yeah. one of the things now uh, our audience uh, doesn't really know or doesn't have a chemical back, uh, uh, background in chemistry. And one of the things that I found really fascinating in uh, when I studied biology and had uh, first uh, physical chemistry and uh, organic chemistry and biochemistry, I had all those three subjects, is, uh, is I think it's great reflected in, in a question I got from uh, one of my students last week, where I showed you uh, the periodic table of the elements and how, what a glucose molecules look like and an amino acid and stuff like that. And a, a student asked, but can you see this in a microscope? And I, I thought that was a really fascinating question because you can't. So how do you know it's true, <laughs> right? Yeah. And this is where I think organic chemistry and physical chemistry is just such fascinating sciences because it's all it's all by uh, inference right yes you, you, you have some observations and you have to kind of with your mind understand what what's going on and and it's all indirect yes exactly this is this is what what you know this kind of studies what i was doing is actually about you know you have uh you have you you don't you cannot see these things directly because they're too small there's no way to see it there, there are ways to, to to see atoms nowadays right but, but in, in these are few, few people in the world who have the high tech to do it. But most of the scientists who do these studies, they don't see these things directly. They observe it through different, uh, different effects that these have on different measurements. And that means you, you have to combine the knowledge from um, uh, magnetic, nuclear magnetic resonance, from the infrared um, spectroscopy, so how these molecules interact with infrared wave uh, light, and then mass spectrometry. This way, you can determine how heavy these uh, molecules are, and and then chromatography, which is determining how they interact through a water solution to a silica gel uh, sorbent, uh, and and these things, you know, you you combine all these um, measure indirect measurements which are do which you are doing. And you have a sense of some data, and and none of those 
on itself, it really gives you an idea what, what you're observing. But as you take all the information together, you're starting to get more and more of a clear picture on, on what, what you're doing. It's, it's kind of as a puzzle, you know? Each, each of those things that you, me that you measure is one piece of the puzzle, and then you just have to bring it together. And it's kind yes. of all, all is like a big, big brain teaser experiment, how you have to put the puzzle together to have the right picture of what is happening. Yeah, and uh, the right picture of something you can never really uh, see. So you'll keep on having this uh, weird uh, 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 kind of hazy reality that you're trying to infer about. So that, I, I, but that, I think that makes it fascinating. But also having been through all this physical chemistry and organic chemistry and biochemistry, it is a very tangible world. It's really with distances and sizes of atoms and angles and stuff. It's, it's all kind of mapped out in a really uh, very specific uh, uh, picture of what's going on at a level that you can see. And that's the, really the beauty of the mind that this is, this is possible, right? Yes, but, but we have to also know that we, we try to make it uh, visual as we, that we can understand in terms of, you know, structures of organic molecules, models, but we have to know these are only models because we yeah, cannot yeah. see this in reality. This is not how these things look like. No. So, uh, it's for it's example, also... an electron cloud is more a probability uh, than a real uh, orbital planet system, right? It's more, mm -hmm. uh, then it starts to become really hairy when you go to the atom and, and quantum mm -hmm. level, right? But, yes. but, but it's interesting that you have above the quantum level, which is a really weird world, you have already organic chemistry. That is, you can, you, you can come surprisingly far by un, uh, understanding atoms and small molecules like uh, Lego uh, boxes. So I know just below that you have the weird quantum world, but it really condenses this into a really specific, uh, it's, it's, so in a sense, organic chemistry and biochemistry, if you like Lego, you have a pretty good advantage already. It doesn't behave yes. that weird anymore. Mm -hmm. So, so it's it's a, I, I really uh, love that uh, uh, organic chemistry. Yeah, it's, it's like building blocks. Yes. Of, of everything, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's 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 building blocks. But there's always an odd color in these building blocks, and this sometimes makes this, um, you know, uh, that it's not something doesn't work as you expected by the theory. There's always can be some effects that are coming from the quantum world or from the you know. Yeah. solvent world and so on so so the whole thing is complex and and this you know this brings us, us actually very nice to coffee when we start to talk about organic chemistry because organic chem coffee is organic chemistry so organic yes. chemistry is the chemistry of the carbon atom of the molecules that are um related to to the carbon atom chemistry right yeah and, and the whole coffee basically is maybe a few percent minerals which is inorganic, and then we have everything else organic. And yeah. this is to, to, to just also um, continue with how my world into coffee comes from the, this fundamental uh, analytical chemistry plant, plant um, extract science. Um, so I started to work with antioxidants, polyphenols, and that we know that coffee is also very strong in antioxidant activity. And this is how a part of my thesis, my PhD thesis was also about coffee antioxidants, and I come into contact with uh, Professor Yerevsian from the Zurich University of Applied Sciences, where I'm also now working since, since then, where I did a part of my experimental work for the, my PhD, that was in two, started in 2011, uh, on coffee antioxidants. And this is where I, I made this bridge from just being focused on chemistry and all different plants, extracts, polyphenols, and all these molecules, into being more focused into coffee. And I really started to like this topic because I realized that many of those other materials that I was studying, they're quite well known. We can sum up everything that we know, what is in there, what molecules are, how they affect us, you know, the bioactivity, the, 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 you know, the stringency of tannins and things like this. You can analyze and you can say, oh, so much percent of this or, the, or that molecule or the other molecule. But when it comes to coffee, Suddenly, it's 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 such a studied, more studied topic than what I studied before, but we know less about it, and that's why I studied. This is very exciting from a scientific point of view, and and this is something that really needs to be studied much more. And I went into this field, and this is when I also, of course, with coffee, you 
cannot uh, only study it as a you know um, as a subject of of the research uh, because it has too much context with the, with the sensory right because it's a thing that we consume. So this is when I also started to discover specialty coffee and all different coffees and and then it's just you know from then on it started everything the whole <laughs> the whole story right yeah so right now you are only working with with the coffee science right you're not doing other things as well I am 95 percent on coffee science yes there's sometimes other things that are related to the methodologies that we use in our lab that I help others out but it's mainly coffee science so my focus is on uh, what we call the transformation of the coffee. So this is understanding how we need to transform the chemicals in the green beans, the green bean, into something that we extract. Yeah. So this is studying roasting processes, um, grinding uh, of coffee, uh, stability of aroma, release rates of aroma, the behavior of the aroma in coffee particles, uh, the freshness of coffee, the degassing process, um, the, the um, uh, packaging, and, and so on. So everything in this field, this is my main topic of study. But of course, I really like coffee as a um, coffee enthusiast, coffee geek. So I really want to learn everything about coffee from, from the farming, the green bean, the quality to, to consumption. That's good to also have the personal excitement about just drinking coffee, right? That's a, that's a big advantage. <laughs> yes, I think, I think if you want to be really an expert in one field, you also have to be personally attached to it and be enthusiastic yes. about it and not only do it as a, as a subject of study, but really also dig deep into, into it from, a, I know, like really enthusiasm is needed to be able to, to understand yeah. something really well. Great. And Samu, could you... It, if you should choose one thing you are most excited about working on right now that you that is not a secret <laughs> you might have some <laughs> secret projects but what are you most excited about working on right now um I, i'm really excited we are working on uh, with a startup that is developing a new roster where we are trying to understand um understand how roasting relates to chemistry of the coffee this is something Ooh. that was quite studied also about, um, you studied, right, quite about this. And I, I cannot say everything in detail at the moment, but this no. the topic of the acids that come up that we discussed already before. Ah, yes. And, and um, you remember we were talking that there's some things that are, despite we studied acids in coffee um, as scientists, I'm not saying, but not, not me personally, as scientists, studied acids in coffee since a long time. There's many coffees that have been analyzed in the organic coffee, uh, organic acid composition in coffee, but we still don't know what exactly it is with the acids in coffee. So that I've been really excited about this because I found that something so um, on the surface, so simple and probably is, has been clarified of what is the case decades ago. We still don't know actually uh, how, uh, how all the acid, organic acids in coffee work work yeah. together, and I'm excited excited about this. Um, it's not Great. directly the part of the project, right? But it's something that uh, we studied in the project. Uh, but then there's a small narrow thing in the project, which is like, wow, this is so exciting. Uh, we really have to look deeper into this, and <laughs> what 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 would be an outcome if we did more experiments after we finish the project. So this is uh, for a startup. So there, there's some funding related to this, right? So when, when can we, and, and I guess there's a lot of secret uh, stuff about this, but it there will be elements published at some point, right? Because that, that's what the scientific or institutions does. So when can the, the listeners here expect to see some interesting oh. <laughs> stuff that you can't say now that will be? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure when from this part, uh, we, we always have, um, just to explain how we work at our university, we work mainly on um, industry-funded projects, which uh, we are, are split into two things. Uh, one is the data that is produced by the project, and one is the methodology that is produced by the project. And in the, our agreements with partners, the data is always the property of the partner, and um, the um, uh, methodology is property of us. Okay. So we can use methodology to further improve the, the, the understanding of coffee, but if we have a, a, a you know 
project with a partner who wants to know something, then of course the data is the, uh, the property of the partner. So that's yeah. why perhaps being an, an university group or university scientist, uh, I have relatively little publications from a scientific point of uh, in a scientific field because many things are uh, confidential. Yeah, but we are trying to get also with you know scientists from the companies that we work with to get things out to you know to to um, to try to to try to you know, make them public. Yeah, okay. okay yeah because we we have this industrial phd with ida in the company and and we have a publication plan because of, uh, we have to so so we'll come out with the first article soon and then the next one hopefully before mm -hmm. summer and then the third yeah. in the in the fall on on sensory methodology so um yeah. okay we, we do have we do have for example papers that are in, in plan with with our partners uh, one is on the um, on the aroma behavior in uh, ground coffee particles uh, with, uh, with relation to temperature and uh, particle size. So having the, the diffusion going really deep into physical chemistry, diffusion coefficients, um, uh, activation energies for the aroma release, and so on. But again, right now we are waiting for an approval that this uh, data could be released to be published. Yeah, so and the fight, organic you know. acid uh, research um, is is that part of the the roasting project? No, that's, project not, that's as well? not part. That's not part of this uh, project that we're doing. The project is I, I can say it's a company called Mikafi. It's a startup that's making a roaster with the goal to make it uh, artificial intelligence control of the roasting. Okay. Uh, so this is this is the public part. So the goal is to have control of the roasting based on a selection of the. A pre selection of desired sensory attributes and roast, roast attributes of a coffee, and that uh, a coffee is selected by an algorithm, not by a person. Yeah, and, and um, uh, because I saw that uh, UC Davis, they published a meta analysis about organic acids uh, last year, I think that was mm -hmm. really interesting, but it wasn't really critical. Uh, in the sense of, uh, and, and this is where we've also done, and I'm very curious, I don't know how much you can say about uh, about your research, but but we are in the publication uh, stage now, and uh, the, it, there are so many angles, and this is also in, in uh, this is what I sp speak about here, if you have a new uh, kind of subject, there are so many questions that you can ask, and that will lead to, if it's a new area, there are hundreds of different projects you can do, so mm -hmm. I was really excited when I saw the US UC Davis um, uh, project because I thought, ah, that's amazing. But I was also also a bit worried if our research was then not <laughs> interesting anymore because perhaps they covered it, but they didn't. Um, so it, I'm, I'm really curious about uh, yeah. what area um, uh, you will cover so that so that we can kind of get a more a clearer picture of of, uh, of, um, of what's going on. But perhaps if, if I don't know how far you are and how much you can talk it's, about it's stuff not, like it's that. It's not we... that far that I would have any clear picture for now. Okay. It's, a, it's okay. an ongoing thing. So it's a thing that I'm really excited about for the future. And um, yeah. Okay, so perhaps that, we can have a, yeah. an episode in, in six months when our work is out and then you can complement with uh, the data that you have that are, that's probably very different. And it might be that uh, it mm -hmm. seems from your data that ours is wrong and then we have the whole scientific kind of improvement <laughs> yeah, of methodology yeah. and conclusions. Yeah, so okay, right yeah, now we've yeah. tried to make a really simple setup where we are proving something. And I'm really curious to get your feedback, but let, let's save that for a later episode. But uh, yeah. that, that's, I'm let's, looking let's very much forward for to later. that. Perhaps we can once talk only about the acids in coffee and acidity. Yes, let, let's, because, let's do that in but, a later but, episode. <laughs> and I should not worry that somebody would cover um, everything in one paper about coffee, because this is the beauty of coffee. There's so many uh, process, there's pro different uh, origins, different uh, varieties, processing methods. Uh, roast profiles, yeah. the extraction methods, and the number of possibilities of coming up to to a coffee brew, it's it's basically infinite in the end, yeah. you know, because you can yeah. vary everything to a small small extent. Uh, but even if you consider that some what you're talking about in your previous you know um, uh, episodes that a small change will not have a um, a big a, effect. A measurable effect, even if you look at all the measurable effect of all the possible coffees that you can brew in the world, is is from a practical point of view infinite. Yeah, yeah, and, and we started with just with a really really simple setup where we can say a very little about a few things, which is a 
which is also so the critic the fair criticism about our study is it's very narrow which means that we just need me re need more research so we are not saying everything that is to be said about uh, organic acids because but but again also following uh, the principles that i'm laying out it's much better to have a simple point about few things that are sure certain and then to build up from there rather than trying to say everything about everything and not really saying anything about anything yeah, so yeah. so so um I, I do agree i do agree this is one of the very really good points that you're pointing out in the in the podcast is about the most simple explanation because what i see more and more in the coffee world is people come up with wild um explanations about what they see when in reality there's a simple explanation that, that can explain this and it's not only in coffee it's it's everywhere like this because this is how our, our brain works we just try to look at the explanations and until we, when we find one that we're happy with uh, we are happy it's a good explanation but it's maybe so complex that there's a way more simple explanation which explains the same principle and then the likelihood of which one is correct and which one is not correct is uh, the, the simple one is much more likely to be the correct explanation even and without knowing which is correct or not and that's also one of the the, the keeping to the simple stuff uh, it's probably more correct because it's closer to what's actually going on at a deeper level um, that's the, one of the things and that also from a when, when when it comes to coffee roasting if you keep to just the understanding that you've got a heat source and that you've got a pile of something being heated up, that's really what's going on. And people want to digress into a lot of curves and weird calculations, mm -hmm. which is okay, but you're, you're going farther and farther from the, the first principles of the system that you're trying to control. And then you, then you lose the intuition. Um, so so, uh, so it, it's really the simpler it is yeah. this, and the simpler you keep things, the the uh, the better you also uh, uh, develop your intuition of, from the empirical level of what's really going on. Exactly, I think it's a good point about the roasting because in in, in principle, in the end, roasting is just running a chemical reaction, and the simple explanation is for a chemical reaction you need temperature and time. Yes, yes, exactly. And now roasting in different ways is just applying this temperature in different temperature gradients with time into yes. beans and now the question is also the, is it uh, homogeneous is the temperature inside and outside of the one single bean uh, uh, the same or not and what this gradient is this is of course then the always unknown variable in, in the roasting process and then through all these complex things from the outside you know like rate of rise and these things you're perhaps helping yourself understanding the roasting process where in reality it's only about the temperature inside of the bean yeah, and the rate of rise is something about the speed of the process. And this, when when it comes to my principle, third principles of form follows function, means that you should only speak about rate of rise when it's relevant and not when it's irrelevant or if you could have spoken about what you're speaking about in simpler terms. I've noticed, um, for example, I listened to Tim Venelbo's podcast, uh, and it was Patrick Rolf interviewing Tim about how did they go about transitioning from a probat to a uh to a loring and and tim was always he was always just talking about yeah we tried to add a lot of energy in the beginning or in the middle of so he was staying with the first principles he was staying with talking about adding a lot energy at different phases rather than saying then i uh, went for a high rate of rise here if you if you have a high rate of rise it is a consequence of a high flame so it's better to keep your vocabulary with the first principles of the system rather than digressing into these derived calculations of derived uh, things, right? <laughs> so, so in your vocabulary, try to stay with with the uh, the basic stuff rather than kind of go into the uh, to the more fluffy derived values of uh, dependent parameters, right? To st yeah. stick to the independent parameters, which is the first principles and the cause of everything going on in the system. But it, it, yeah. it's weird because it's, and I think as a as scientist, and I think that's also talking about uh, the empirical, the, the kind of the discipline that you've had to go through uh, to really make sure that you didn't make errors when trying to think about the empirical world that you were investigating. 
I think that that just gives a kind of respect for not saying something that is too complicated that will confuse you because if you just get a, a small confusion introduced, then your, <laughs> your your way of understanding what you're doing is just completely lost, right? You have to stay yes. disciplined. Otherwise, yeah. you will uh, you will lose your understanding on what actually is going on mm -hmm. at a level you can't see, right? Yes, exactly. And this this is why you need always an experimental plan if you yes. want to study something, you know? And, and you need an experimental plan for everything that you're going to study, otherwise you're not getting uh, anywhere. And you need an experimental plan and the correct methods yes. uh, to, to, to find what, what, you are, uh, what you want to find out. And I really want to, want to quote you in one of your podcasts, you said that the uh, quote you correct method is at the heart of the reliable knowledge. I yes. think this is such an important statement for science and for coffee and for everything. Whatever you do, you have to uh, first think about, before even planning the experiment, you first want to think about the correct method that you're going to do to investigate this. Yes. Because without the method, you will never get the results. Yeah, and without the correct method, you'll net not get relevant results. And without a method at all, you'll just have a lot of opinion. And that, that's the point of Plato. He said that the difference between opinion and the uh, episteme or true knowledge is methodology. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that, that said uh, thousands of years ago, and <laughs> it's still something that is only implemented uh, places. But this is sometimes when you go as a coffee geek or go as a, uh, as, as a, uh, could also be a fitness geek of where when you go to a university, you'll see very few kind of apparatuses. I'm sure if you if I go to your place and I have been there, you'll only see a few. You've got DCMS, HPLC, NMR, and uh, you only have a few methods, but they are just all of them are just optimized infinitely to a method, right? So every time you have a question you'll try to reduce it to be answered to one of these methods. So it's not that you can kind of geek out with a lot of different methodologies because you can only use the ones that historically has been really proven to, to work, right? So, so and that's, that's also, I'm more mm -hmm. at method. So I feel that in Coffee Mind, we are method experts. Uh, we also, of course, uh, after the, the years, uh, coffee geeks, but, but the method is really, if we, if we, I'm not, I'm more as uh, when people ask me about things, I'm always trying to kind of, okay, how can we do this correctly from mm -hmm. a method perspective where clients, they have thousands of questions and not really a real goal. And I have, I need to know what the goal is and mm -hmm. we need to confine ourselves to one question. And if yeah. the client can't yeah. confine themselves to one question, then I have a problem because I don't know which, which method to use. You wouldn't yeah. know which yeah. machine to go to, right? before yeah, exactly. you have one and only one question mm -hmm. that is structured around uh, the most relevant question that they want to know. They can't get, you cannot have a, or research that's expensive. So then we can probably have 15 questions answered. No, 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 no. <laughs> we have to find the one that you really want to know mm -hmm. and then we'll yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. you need to have a question and a hypothesis, how to solve this and then you need to apply the correct method. And, and this could be, could be, you know, doesn't need to be expensive instruments when you were talking about method and then the experimental plan. We can talk about, you know, uh, you, you extract espresso and then uh, what is the correct method to evaluate? Oh, am I evaluating by weight of the beverage? Am I evaluating by the volume of the beverage? Do I just measure TDS and not care about anything at all? Or I don't care anything at all and I just give it to somebody to taste? And those are four different methods that we use in coffee and, and, uh, and perhaps sometimes we really indiscriminately just use them randomly, right? Uh, but but not, not re realizing that each of them is connected to one another and each of them gives us uh, additional information to better understand this beverage. Uh, yes, and and this, is, this is this thinking, you know, that you need to apply the correct method for what you want to know. And and this is this is interesting because again, yeah, science doesn't need to be complicated. It could be the 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 contrary. For example, I've been thinking about developing a, a really simple course with with the uh, Nova Simonelli Knowledge Hub, where we will simply um, measure, uh, for example, the color of a coffee, and measure TDS, 
and then teach people to make a parameter estimate, which is the 95 uh, confidence interval, to, to get a sense of how many readings do I need to, uh, to, to do in order to get a narrow enough 95% uh, confidence interval for the purpose that I need? So what is the threshold, for example, uh, color uh, threshold for uh, my QC protocol? Do I accept plus minus three uh, actron? Then if you, if, if you almost have an apparatus that always give you this, the very close um, kind of readings, only plus minus one and a half, then you can might perhaps get away with doing two readings. But if you're doing research where it has to be exactly the same color where you are working with plus minus one actron, then you might have to do five readings. So teaching mm -hmm. people the, the, the idea that you have variation, but you can beat the variation with a repeated measurement but, uh, but the, the number of repetitions you need depends on the question that you are asking, uh, which will tell you how narrow does it need to be. So that's the one thing. It's a pretty simple thing, right? It's not mm -hmm, advanced, mm -hmm. but it's really important. And then you could do a t-test where, for example, you could do a slightly darker roast. And then you would have to see how, how many readings do you, would, do you need to have before you can actually see that they are different. In, mm -hmm. in the ANOVA or the T-test, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To, to, to just under, let people understand what is a parameter estimate and what is a, 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 how do you calculate a p-value? And, really, and, and, and as you said, it doesn't need to be advanced. It just needs to be specific, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is, I think this is great to do such, such very, very um, simple experiments that actually everybody's kind of doing, but not in a systematic way. They don't approach the, uh, it from a design of experiment. They just do it and then have the results. But if you make a plan how to do this experiment, then you can also derive much more of the knowledge from the experiment. Yes. But of course, here we are having one thing. We are assuming everything is completely random because we're using statistic normal distribution. But one thing that I really sometimes um, uh, I'm missing to, to have more understanding of this, and not only in coffee, but also in science in general, is the uh, systematic or the systematic errors. Because there can always be a case where this is not, uh, something is not behaving completely randomly, and you have a certain systematic error. So it means that there's a, some sort of, you know, instrumental bias, human bias, uh, you know, you're handling uh, a sample manually at some point in the experiments you're doing and you're making a mistake which is not random but either appears or not perhaps so to speak or um, or is an instrumental bias for example um, uh, just simply TDS measurements for example TDS is total dissolved solids right so Total dissolved solids means if you evaporate the water, what is left solid, those are your total dissolved solids. But everybody now is using uh, refractometers, which are extremely well calibrated on a certain range of um, range of uh, TDSs, but and compositions of coffee at a certain extraction yield. But if you perhaps, I'm not saying this is the case, but no, just hypothetically, if you're outside of a certain range of an instrument, which it was not meant for, not designed for this use, perhaps you are not uh, within the calibration zone. So the instrument has some sort of bias, either to a too high value, to low value. And this, this way you are making a systematic error in your measurement. So no matter how many repetitions you're doing, you can measure it yeah. thousand times and thousand mm -hmm. times get the same exact value. You know exactly what your scatter of the value is. But if you made a systematic error somewhere, either through a human error or through an instrumental bias in your measurements, you will have an error. That's interesting because TDS is something that have annoyed me a bit over the years. I, I just get so big variations when I read. It might be that I'm not a burst and haven't done it enough, but I have done it quite a, a, a lot of times, I would say. And I I just don't really trust the value. Uh, and, um, and and then also I've, I have three different refra refractometers mm -hmm. and I've, I've measured the same coffee on all of them and they are they are definitely not measuring the same. That's a really good mm -hmm. Example I mean, of an this, instrumental error, huh? This is calibration. This is instrumental error, which in most of the cases can be well corrected if you make a standard uh, solution. So, 
So this is another thing that is is perhaps to talk about are the controls or calibrants. Yeah. So, so both in both. So in this case, it actually you need a calibration solution. You need to have um, a solution of a known TDS, right? You need to line up those those uh, refractometers that give different values, and you need to put the same solution of a known TDS to each of them, and and see how much they're off, and then recalibrate the calibration uh, to match the number. So this is what in inter in terms of chemical analysis we're always doing with every and nearly every analysis that we're doing, uh, because when we want to for every analysis when we want to have quanti quantitative number. We do a calibration. So we yeah. have known something that we know how much it is in. And this is interesting because the, the I remember from uh, from medical statistics that you've got something called the gold standard, and then you have the clinical tests that mm -hmm. are um, so the gold standard in in uh, medical is uh, expensive, time consuming, and uh, and uh, with risk. Right, it's typically with the invasive, mm -hmm. so that you need to operate somebody. But often you can develop a test. That is almost uh, uh, it's 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 good enough because it's 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 cheaper, faster, and non-invasive, right? Mm -hmm. So 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 at the university you have all the equipment to 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 do the uh, to measure the gold uh, the gold standard way, but people in 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 a in a daily operations they only have a TDS meter. But it could be interesting if you can help them calibrate it so it actually becomes not only eighty percent as good as the gold standard, but ninety nine percent. That's an interesting uh, uh, yes. this help. Is, this is the calibration part, right? The, the second part is the instrumental bias because it might be calibrated only on this number, but I know plus minus some number, but it might not be calibrated um, on another uh, value. And if yeah. I'm not mistaken, the, the, from, the, from the factory, these instruments are calibrated on instant copy solution. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but this is somehow I, I remember reading it somewhere, perhaps in the patent of one of those, um, that it's a, um, calibrated by, um, a ref, say, it's a refractive measurements, and the refractive measurements is a function of the concentration of a uh, instant coffee concentration, because this is something you can very precisely dose uh, into and create a solution of a known instant coffee concentration. And therefore, you have a uh, calibrated uh, measure, right? But then, then what? What? Where? Where we can make an error here is in instant coffee has slightly different uh, composition than the, so the solids. They have a slightly different composition than, for example, a specialty right roast because in most cases it's heavily extracted, hydrolyzed dark roasted coffee. So perhaps uh, there are some. Uh, in ranges where it might have um, a bias. Not saying and that it has because if it's not tested. I have no 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 idea. But just you know, just speaking purely hypothetically about what kind of situations can bring us to an instrumental bias. But it's interesting. That it also depends on the purpose uh, of of the reading, right? Because sometimes, and this is very relevant in product development and quality control. Perhaps you don't really care about the true TDS, but you're just you're just you just want to repeat and have a way of quantifying that you did repeat mm -hmm. uh, what you already uh, mm -hmm. what you did before. For example, the the I think we talked about this during the uh, uh, the the CAS uh, session that in a sense it doesn't matter that the temperature reading in a in a coffee roaster if it shows you the right value or not. You're just using it for repeatability, mm -hmm. but but this is where it's very important that 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 you the, the, again the form follow, follows function. What method do you choose, so that if people know that they are using it for product development and the quality control, they don't need to care about that much about the TDS. But sometimes they may might find themselves in a situation where they really want to know um, if it's correct, and then they might seek out you or perhaps if if you if I don't know if we could make available a way of 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 uh, calibrating your your own TDS meter then then people would would uh, have value of of uh, of uh, investing in going through that process uh, so so sometimes it's needed and sometimes uh, it's not needed it depends on the purpose of the process that you're trying trying to to control right 
Yes, exactly. So again, we're talking about the correct method for the application. So correct method is not only which tool you're using, but also how the tool is calibrated and set up. Yeah. Sometimes and we, we use the same tool in a much more simple way. And sometimes we use the tool to its full potential depends on the need. Yeah, and sometimes you can use a much more expensive uh, piece of equipment that doesn't really even give you an, a better result than something if you just, for example, uh, weigh the coffee or uh, evaporate the water or something much simpler, right? Okay, so... I, have, I, I, I yeah. just thought, thought of another, uh, this bias, uh, instrumental bias, actually, where you mentioned quality control, and if it's quality control, then it's all good. But for a case, for example, for measuring uh, the humidity of uh, roasted coffee, the moisture content of uh, roasted coffee and green coffee, you know, we use this, uh, the, the standard method is by drying, right? So you dry it to, to, to evaporate all the water, but there's this capacitive measure, uh, meters, which I measure in a, in, a, in a few seconds, the, um, uh, the moisture content. And there in a quality control setting, for example, if you have, you, you measure the, the, the moisture of um, roasted coffee. And if the coffee was quenched by water and there is high moisture on the surface of the beam and not inside of the beam, this will bring a completely different measurement than the reality, for, as an example. Yeah, and, and yeah you might, because you might... the water is not distributed uh, perfectly. Exactly, yes. And then you might have you know, a measurement of 15% moisture content in a in a in roasted coffee, which is completely impossible. When reality, you have you know you quenched it. There's some more water, so you maybe have three three and a half percent. But the meter is easily saying 15 percent. 15%. So it's kind of a complete a complete systematic error. But it comes from not applying the correct method, because the method is not only the instrument that is used, but it's also what you do with the sample before you use the instrument. Yeah. So in this case, the part of the method also has to be that you need to take this coffee, put it into a bag, leave it standing for a certain time that the moisture is homogeneously distributed between all the beans, and then measure the, the sample. Yeah, and, and again, it's, it's, it's a problem when you're using uh, something that is not the gold standard, right? If yes, you're exactly. using a quick, yes. quick method, so yeah. one that is uh, quicker, cheaper, and less invasive. Um, I remember I have uh, when I was teaching a medical uh, uh, research design, I, I had kids, so I knew exactly the uh, just to give the readers an, uh, a more uh, perhaps down to earth explanation between the gold standard test and a, and a quick test. If you have a kid, uh, sometimes you have to change the diaper because they've made uh, what's it called? Yeah, you know, the nature's uh, things, things needs to go, get, go out again. So the gold standard of testing whether you need to change the diaper is to actually have a look, right? And sometimes you do that because you can have, you can have a false negative and a false positive. Sometimes a false positive uh, or a, a, a false, false negative um, is uh, when when it 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 doesn't smell, but there's something, right? <laughs> and and a false positive is if the, it was just air and not nothing came out. And most often you are right when you don't uh, take a look because it's quicker and uh, you know <laughs> uh, less invasive and and all this to just infer from does it smell or not. But you are only 80% right because you can have a, a true positive, a true negative, and you can have a false positive and a false negative. So when you're using a faster, cheaper, and less invasive method, you are most often wrong. But if you if you use the gold standard, then you are always right or wrong. So, uh, but but this is but it's because most often when we are uh, when for example the TDS is a perfect example. It's a, a cheaper. Uh, faster and and less invasive. Uh, you're not drying the coffee, right? You're not destroying the coffee that you are that you're using as you would do in the oven method. So it we are often using uh, less than gold standard in our daily lives, which is great. But then we need to be even more careful about how we can be wrong because it's not the gold standard. So as you said, if you assume that it doesn't matter uh, if it's quenched or not then then we we have to be more careful but of course 
we shouldn't turn every roastery into some. They shouldn't buy a GCMS, a HPLC, and an MR before they can. They have uh, <laughs> uh, the QC protocol okay. nailed, right? Of so course, of course not. There's always an optimum cost cost effectiveness uh, way of doing something, and the cost effectiveness in the roastery quality control lab differs very much from an uh, research chemistry research coffee lab. But perhaps Simon, we should have a session, an offline session, where we could kind of brainstorm if we could help make some really simple uh, methods to help people with the most uh, normal kind of uh, quick tests uh, done in a, in a roastery, and see if it could be fun to to find out ways of kind of of uh, helping the community that way. Um, so yeah, so uh, Simon, and I we talked a bit about this that. Uh, in my podcast it well normally i consider myself a nice guy and i am but i was just a bit overwhelmed how uh, negative i i sounded and how much i actually because it's all the things that ida and i have been speaking about behind the scenes and i just thought i have to put it out there and then i just need to kind of get the honest result from the from yeah. uh, from the world uh, uh, on all the things where i was wrong and this is exactly why i wanted to invite somebody with the capacity like you, uh, Samu, to kind of uh, comment uh, because, um, so I really wanted uh, you to kind of tell me what you liked about it and what you didn't like, because we talked about that when I told you that I was a bit worried about how people would react and I'm a very negative and kind of tearing a lot of things mm -hmm. down. You said, but that's, that's, that's because that's the scientific method. Yes, it's the you, scientific you, method. Exactly, you are yeah. very critical. So, you have to so be in, negative. You yeah. have to be negative in order to prove something. Because if you're not negative, if you just accept something as true, always as true, then you're not getting anywhere. Then you find, okay, this is true. I will not study anything about it. But I think personally, for me, the best way to prove something is to try to disprove it. And if you if you use all your means to try to disprove it, and you cannot disprove it, then it is most likely true. Yeah, or it, at least it's the best model we have of the world right now, right? Or or, or at least this, yes, because the yeah. true what is true is also that's a philosophical question, right? As yeah. Well, uh, but um, within the context of the knowledge that we have at the moment, that's the best answer that we can give. And uh, this is. This is my approach, also how I work in science and in coffee. Um, I try to look for, a, for an answer. And once I, I have an answer, I don't stop there. I, then you need to test because one, one is the making the, the uh, now we're talking earlier about um, finding the, the question to answer. That's the first thing, then a hypo hypothesis. You need to decide on the methods. You need to make an experimental plan. You need to make the, uh, all the measurements, have no systematic errors. You need to do the statistics to find the, the, how reliable your result is. And then you have a result, right? But then you, you should not stop there. You should then try to question the result and then ask yourself, first thing is, does this, end, does this result make sense, you know? Yeah. And, then and, and, and how, could, how could I be wrong? Not because... Yeah. And, and science is not an infinitely self-critical kind of uh, approach. It's just, you have to remember to be self-critical, right? Uh, because only by, by being self-critical and being very critical towards other, then we kind of uh, progress as a community. Yes, yes, exactly. Because if you, if you think of it like this, you, you come to one conclusion and you start to be self-critical, you can come up easily with four or five questions you know and this is how we need to progress in the community in society and in coffee we need to you know study something find a result and then ask ourselves you know is this correct try to get more questions and this is what actually happens sometimes we try to we try to answer something and then we we find out that this answer actually brings us five new problems that we have not talk, talk, thought about this before. And even without having this answer, we would never have thought about these problems that we have. And this is, and this is how we progress. Yeah. 
and and this is where there's not a lot of that in in the coffee community uh, yet so I, I kind of tried to uh, come up with a lot of things that could be better uh, from a method uh, perspective and uh, and this is where it was interesting to hear your uh, that you said yeah that's just the scientific approach to kind of be be that critical and and that it could be interesting to to uh, to have more of that in the community to get us further and this is for example the sca copying protocol i'm i'm really trying to be very very specific about why i think it's not a good method and mm -hmm. i haven't really heard many other i have never really heard a lot of criticism about about it <laughs> so that's why yeah. i really i was a bit worried uh, if somebody would, would be offended and stuff like that but and that might still come but that's okay because then at least we can talk about this at a at, at a higher level right um, yes but but of course you know we this this all sounds negative but our goal is in terms of you and me both being also educators in coffee and try to popularize science we we, we should you know focus and try to design experiments that make this uh this kind of things that are actually not fun at all and you have to be negative and critical but we should have kind of try to design things to do this in a fun way. Yeah. As you know, you're doing a, a lot with the sensory kits and, and this um, coffee mind uh, and, you know, experiments, which are kind of fun way of learning things that are actually kind of not, should not be fun in, in principle, yeah. because you have to be critical, you have to be negative and you have to be strict in order to get to the uh, conclusive results. And this is where it becomes really interesting. What role does science have? Because um, and this is also one of the things that I, I remember a quote from, from Stephen Lee that I think that we want to express art, right? That, that your personal um, uh, excitement about coffee is artistic and not technical, right? And, and this is, so this is the goal, but, but, but in order to make sure to get, uh, to create a, an a, a aesthetic experience, there is some fundamental technicalities that you need to be clear about and not confused about. So, so for example, I mean, just while we speak about this, I'm envisioning that in order to make the community progress, we need more explicit collaboration between scientists and the educators in the business, because the educators are great. They help people create better results. But I'm, now I've been an educator for many years and I've said a lot of things that's not true. And I've also noticed that, that a lot of educators are not really self-critical. They'll, they'll say something that I just know that is completely wrong. And I'm just thinking, why don't you just fact, just spend three minutes fact checking before you say mm -hmm. something about mm -hmm. science yeah. so that you don't have to say something that's just not true. Yes. And, 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 but, but, but then again, I don't want to discourage people to do education because all oh, the scientists will tell you that you are never saying anything wrong. I, I want to kind of, we need to work together, scientists and educators, to make sure that the criticism becomes constructive so that we can express the art. We don't want to kill the art with scientific negativity, right? So it's mm -hmm. a balance. And this is why I think the responsibility with, uh, talking between scientists and educators is really a, it, it, it's really a big responsibility because only then it will be constructive and not destructive. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And, and it also has to do with what you said. Oh, you know, take, take three minutes to, um, to find the real information. You know, perhaps for you, it's, it's three minutes, but for somebody else doesn't know how to orient, where to look for the information. Yeah, this yeah, is that's where true. I think this, uh, core, uh, this um, connection is really, really beneficial is because if you ask, you or me is something that we know very well. And, and I, I, I know that I'm not very knowledgeable in everything, but if, I, if somebody asks me something, first thing I go, I try to look at the sources, you know? I try to look at the sources and then I, I get my uh, opinion about it, you know? And then and to be honest, in most cases, this, the answer is, I don't know, you know? I'm not afraid to, to, to answer this question. Um, and let's just say, I, I can't say, you know, because I don't have information about this. But sometimes, you know, I get asked something and I, I look for, for sources and I find sources which are completely disproving the, uh, what is, what is the, the, the kind of common truth in the, in the coffee. So, 
And this helps, you know, this kind of relation helps both the educators and the scientists to grow. So, so I, I, I get, a, when I talk to people who are in education or, or coffee geeks and so, I also grow myself because they ask me questions for who I don't have answers. And I, I look into this and I learn myself, which, because I would never have questions, this question myself. Yes. So that, that it's a really uh, amazing uh, kind of connection, science and education, I, uh, I think. And that's also why I was very disappointed with the SCAE and the SCAA merged. I was still doing the, the roasting uh, curriculum. And there was a lot of confusion, I guess, that made it just completely, I didn't want to spend more time on it. Uh, the, the, the kind of the structure we had to work on didn't, it would kill my company. So I opted out in 2018. But one of the things I was really, and <laughs> yeah, why am I not just honest about this? There was no explicit, I asked if the, who is responsible for the joint collaboration between education and research in the organization. And there was nobody. And I, I really think that in, in SCA, that it has kind of, uh, the, the research and the, and the education has, it's never really been collaborating, um, uh, at least not since the, the merger. And, and I hope that that's just a kind of uh, a, a, um, a, a confusion in the establishing years that at some point they'll strengthen, strengthen that uh, kind of connection because only then I think that the, uh, there's full speed on helping the community. Otherwise, it's just getting a lot of money for research and get a, as, as much money from education without really trying to systematically make research and education work together for the better of the community. So I think that's, that's a very, very important connection and it has to be an explicit responsibility among specific people in an organization to work. It won't just happen with a, by a coincidence. It happens when you speak with a, with with people in the community, and I've noticed that the that the CHV has invested a lot of time for 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 you to visit all the events before Corona, and I think that that is that is a habit or an investment to help the community to make sure that you spend yeah. time together simply. And I think that 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 has been amazing to see how much you've invested time to be at roasters camp at the world of coffee and, mm -hmm. and all these things mm -hmm. and that's also where we've met and and, and talked uh, several times so i think mm -hmm. that that's an example of an institution deciding to invest in connecting right that's yes great. i mean this are, these are some of the best experiences i have in coffee you know go to go to events and connect with people because there's so many uh different backgrounds in coffee because there's no you know there's no university to do a bachelor in coffee or a master's in coffee for now, right? Yeah. And this means that people from all sorts of background come into coffee, you know, from more of a science, natural sciences point of view, like you and me, but you also, for example, you having more philosophy um, a training, and then people come from economic, from finance, you know, and you start to get a uh, completely different point of view of some things. And this is, I think, where the, where the coffee community is so strong. It's, it's really strong because there's people from, the most diverse backgrounds, as you can imagine, in one community, yes. and yes. this is this is very very strong, but also it brings uh, brings this you know negatives because, in the end, the the coffee beverage and coffee bean the, those are chemicals. It's chemistry, and what is happening when you're doing something with it is physics. So so in the end, it has to it has to do all the the explanations, the interpretations, the understanding, it's mostly down to chemistry and physics. It is uh, indeed. And, and that can be a bit uh, difficult for people to, to navigate correctly. But I think we've already, we talked about acids and also sugars and it, it, people are talking about sugars and acids all the time as if it's true that they modulate, for example, right? Mm -hmm. right? We, mm -hmm. we found in some of our research that as a clear, modulation of, uh, of uh, perceived sweetness and the sugars are below sensitive threshold and they don't change <laughs> right yeah, so yeah. It, it's not the sugars and also the acids and and everybody wants to talk about uh, molecules uh, and and if you don't have a science background you don't know that it's much more com complicated than yeah, that right it's much more complicated because you know this this is only until we start to consume it 
what I was talking about physics and chemistry. Once you put the coffee into a human body, then it, it does a lot of other things, right? Then it's um, uh, more of a, a physiological effects on your receptors, which is kind of also chemistry, biochemistry. But, and, but this is only the first step. The second step is to know how this interacts with your brain, with your neurons, and then how you interact with it, you know, and all goes all the way to sociology here and the yeah. consumer behavior and so on. So it makes an immensely complex field, yeah. uh, which from one point of view is really why it's so exciting to, to study coffee, right? Because it is indeed and the listeners might be, uh, then think oh it's very complicated and it is because there's a lot of links and there's a lot of complicated models but again it's it's also refreshing to think but the best models are simple right yeah. <laughs> the best the best explanations are simple so in a sense uh, uh, that's kind of uh, reassuring and it also makes it easier for for you to kind of communicate uh, yes. uh, even if you don't know why things happen, you know, doing something very well in coffee, it's relatively simple. If you don't complicate too much everything, you know, you have, for example, you were talking uh, when you were part of our uh, classroom at our course, you know, this approach that you just roast, how was it, uh, nine minutes with one and a half minute development time or something like this uh, with a roaster. And then for most of the cases, you will get a reasonably good roast. You will not be having roast, roast defects and there's you no know, other other standards in the extraction in the and in, in everything there's some sort of you know things that if you follow will be uh, you can be quite good without the understanding but the question is we want to be you know strive for better and this needs understanding to go to go a step ahead yeah, and that's a, when i see people talking about the you need to understand the chemistry of roasting to be a good uh, coffee roaster. I completely disagree. You don't need to know anything about chemistry to to great 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 coffee. You just need to know who do you want to to please, what green coffees are needed, and how how do you how can you roast it in terms of time and temperature. That's it. That's <laughs> it is as simple need, as yeah. of of that. Yes. Then if you are a geek like we are, we want to kind of go into the chemistry to understand what's going on, and that can also help with innovation and education and stuff like that. But in order to roast coffee, you don't need to know anything about chemistry. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> where the coffee is so interesting because you can take so many points of view of how you look at it. You know, you can just dismiss all the science and look at it from an art point of view. Or it can be the most complex science you can imagine. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, we still don't know what the composition of, let's say, half or 60% of the coffee, of the solids in the coffee or the coffee bean is, you know, like melanoid. Then we don't know what those chemicals are, but we know they bring um, a brown color to coffee and their antioxidants. We know part of their structure, but nobody really knows what exactly they are. And yeah. this is why coffee is... Um, incredibly interesting to work with yeah and this is where i think science the one of the best things the uh, science can do is to kind of debunk uh, all the myths myths right not to tell uh, non-scientists that they shouldn't say anything because they kind of make it, but but at least to uh, weed out all the nonsense that's that's said because what's left after you weeded out the nonsense is amazing right but it's it's mm -hmm. great to have have removed all these things and also, over the years, I've been teaching, and I, I'm pretty sure that 80% of what I say is true, and then 80, 20% is probably not. But I don't know what the 20 is. So, so, and that's my problem. <laughs> I don't know what the 20 is, and this is why I would like somebody with critical thinking, such as you and others, to kind of help me out, weed out my yeah, my yeah. nonsense, right? Because I'm not sure that I know myself what it is. Exactly, Even, because we are yeah. not experts on everything. There's always things no. that you miss. You know, you might be sloppy. You're not. You're you you're not perfect at everything. You'll make mistakes, and and it's good that we are a community and we can correct ourselves. And you can say, "Oh, look, Morton, you did not do this correctly," or you say, "Oh, someone oh, look, this completely doesn't make sense." And I'll be like, "Okay, yeah, sure, I was I was wrong. You know, this really didn't make sense." And this this happens. Uh, you know, should should happen quite daily in a, in a life of scientists because if you have so many things which are really hard to understand and which are not really known, it's 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 completely normal that 
some assumptions that you make uh, within the information that you got you had at a certain time uh, are suddenly not correct anymore because you have new information which completely disproves the information the the the, uh, the theory you had before yeah and that, that's when i continue this podcast and hopefully you will you will you will hear it then then one day you will call me and tell me i'm wrong with something i'm looking <laughs> i'm looking forward to that day Samuel. because because is there anything if just kind of to on 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 the last part of the the podcast here so if you should mention one thing you think is the biggest value of the podcast is and if you can think about uh if you should say something where you where you anything critical about it i'm i'm very open mm -hmm. to hear that as well so so what do you think is when you heard it what was kind of refreshing or what is it that you felt that this is actually useful for the community this is this is valuable and there's not enough of this already if you should just yeah. mention one thing i will i will be now a bit uh, not nasty but i will mention one thing which is both the best thing and the weakness of the podcast. It's, it's really the, the depth of it and looking from a philosophical point of view about science, uh, I think it's amazing because nobody ever looked into coffee science from this point of view as you did in this podcast, really looking into the roots of this, you know, the philosophical thinking of science, of the, you know, of how we work as a civilization on these principles to advance, right? And, and translate this into coffee. This is this is the really an amazing thing. But on the other hand, it's it's quite a complex topic. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's it's hard to grasp, and uh, it, you really need to stay very very focused to listen to this. And 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 this is something that I think this kind of content it's always uh, a problem. Yes, and, and I, I'm also making a joke about that, I think, in, in I don't know if it's episode six that I, that, I, that I noticed that this is very long and very complicated, and it's a bit ironic for somebody who is uh, kind of uh, trying to promote simplicity. <laughs> 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 but but I, I think, but that's also the, this podcast is made for the people who are deep in either uh, education or science. So, so my podcast I, 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 this is not to, this is not for the beginners. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so this is with this podcast, I'm trying to influence the influencers in a, in a sense, or my peers. I really, I'm really trying to have the discussion at the highest level, because then if, if, if we as a community, let's say we are some thought leaders, we need to have a forum to speak about these things where we can just speak openly and without thinking oh who's my audience and so for me it's the coffee partners who want to get the deepest knowledge and that at the deepest level because there are some people of those out there right and mm -hmm. these are the ones who would tune in and the and and i'm also planning to do some much shorter episodes a mm -hmm. much simpler hands-on but i just wanted to get this long detailed uh, kind of podcast mm -hmm. series out there, at least so it exists for the people who want to take things at this level. So um, yes, definitely, I also learned from listening to this podcast because, uh, to be honest, I did not know all the philosophical backgrounds that are used for the things that we do in science. Since I start from the experimental approaches in science, which use this, and but I did not know where this actually all comes from and what kind of thinking was historically used. That we developed these these uh, methodologies and concepts, and, it and it's is, interesting because I've also had you know when I studied biology, we also had theory of science, and I wasn't really interested, and few were <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and then I study, then I was teaching theory of science for medical <laughs> students at the university, mm -hmm. and it was very clear that they were only there because they had to be there. <laughs> so when when you study something and you get theory of science, it's all often the most uh, kind of borrowing on yeah that's where you can kind of we just meet and you talk a bit right ah, um, and this is where i and uh, with my major in uh, in in philosophy uh, where i specialized in 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 in, in uh, theory of science uh, that's not my opinion right that i majored mm -hmm. in that so i really i really feel very strongly positively for this and that's why i've kind of and this is why i feel that it's it's interesting to see that it's actually 
practically useful to weed out nonsense in a community. So for the first yeah. time in my life, I can see that my uh, my long haired uh, education is practically useful mm. useful for somebody. So I'm. I, that was that was that was actually great to kind of that's such a fulfilling that. moment right that you <laughs> yeah. you know that you worked hard for something now you see that you're useful in the society <laughs> yeah yeah so I, I i kind of look took a different approach you know with my instagram posts that i started to do lately and i think the 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 kind of the frustrations that in the in, in this uh, what we we're kind of talking about and it's not real frustrations but you know these things that are happening that led me to, to start to get to the um, coffee get to the coffee community to uh, closer to approach it is, is exactly what you're doing to professionals I try to do to the most um, you know coffee geeks and, and coffee nerds and coffee enthusiasts just try to see how we think as a scientist and really try to uh, simplify it but in a very narrow way narrow topic uh you know deep in but very simple you know and try yeah. to look at some things that you know you mentioned this about the sweetness right really just try to really explain in an extremely simple way just one fact there's not enough sugars in coffee that it, they make it sweet you know and that's it and not to go into too much around just that uh yeah. present how we know that this is the case there is data people do studies but don't go into anything around because then people get overwhelmed with information. Yes. And I think this is this is another way of, of looking at it. Is it's to not to promote this thinking that we have is really to just do it really stepwise by very very small steps. Yeah, and I think I also noticed your Instagram post and I love them. I think this is exactly reaching out. What I, as I said, you know we. We need to, as a scientist, we need to reach out to the community and the community needs to reach out to us. We need to have a systematic collaboration. And I think your Instagram posts are amazing for, for kind of starting, reaching out, starting this awareness and, and, and collaboration. So that uh, hopefully you will, you'll keep on doing them. I will, I will keep doing it. I have a next one uh, in the pipeline about acidity and... Uh, ah, great yeah, stuff. Uh, but I, I'm I'm a bit afraid that we'll only ask raise more questions than uh, answer questions. But that's what we like as scientists, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> great. But Samu, I think we uh, we've exceeded an hour that I promised you we would uh, kind of keep it to. But I also said it might uh, uh, be a bit longer, which which happens. So um, that's, that's thank you expected. so much it's for your time. And and how how will people uh, be able to uh, to kind of uh, uh, meet you or you've got your CAS course uh, coming up right and uh, what other activities do you have where people from the community could uh, get in touch with you? Yes, uh, we have uh, at our university we have a, a certificate called the CAS Certificate of Advanced Studies. So it's a course for anybody who has already a university degree to continue education. And we uh, focus, of course, on coffee, everything about coffee from uh, biology of, of the coffee plant to the coffee consumer through, you know, trading, green coffee, processing, uh, roasting, grinding, extraction, everything is covered in an online course where we uh, have content. We invite people like experts like from the field, like you, Morten, who talk about certain topics like we, we talk with you about roasting and at every every session we have such a uh, classroom and this is one thing where we are trying to interact with the community to bring the scientific knowledge closer but then we, we're also um, in in involved in uh, coffee events uh, festivals uh, also for example now at the upcoming SCA Expo in Boston I will ha ha have a workshop about oh, uh, grinding, about how to characterize a grinder. Oh, and I'm um, trying to put some scientific experiments that we're doing on grinding into a workshop. So what can amazing. you do uh, yourself with some things, you know? Um, it's kind of, you know, when you dial in a grinder to an extraction that you think for also other things, not only about your extraction, uh, kind of like this, you know, this 
uh, and we're trying to be involved with the community as much as possible because this is, I think, uh, an important thing of a scientist is uh, one thing is doing the science, but there's no purpose of science if you don't communicate it. Yeah, amazing. Will you also be at World of Coffee? Yes, also, yes, at World of with Coffee. the same workshop because I really uh, want to attend that. There, there is no workshops. Uh, the oh, World no, Coffee, that's unfortunately. true. I will have a lecture about uh, the World of Coffee. I submitted, it's not approved yet. I submitted a lecture to have about um performing scientific experiments doing online learning so how to do experiments uh in a, you know remote through okay through. so i have some nice results Easy. from what we did with the students uh, about roasting defects and what kind of you know how can you actually uh, interpret data that you get com from completely uncalibrated unrelated uh, people oh, i'm looking from around so the much world. forward to that ah, great I also submitted two. I'll see if they'll choose one or none. <laughs> <laughs> what did you submit? Um, <laughs> I don't really remember. <laughs> I think one of them was just my the general roasting research we've done. Uh, and the other one was the organic acid um, oh. um presentation and then okay. Ida will also present about her, about her PhD in sensory learning where we are submitting the first article now we've got some amazing data we're so looking so much forward to get that uh, getting that art, article out um, I'm really excited a lot of about work. this <laughs> we've been working on it for eight years now <laughs> <laughs> so finally that's great Okay, Samu, what a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, I can just feel that uh, that uh, we'll have a lot more to talk about. And uh, hopefully you will agree to participate on more episodes later when we get new topics. Um, and I'm looking very much forward to see you. It will probably be in, in Poland at World of Coffee the, the, the next time. So Probably, yes. Um, thank you again, Morten, for inviting me. Uh, it's always exciting to talk with you and uh, you know we have this discussion from time to time and also with our course and i'm really happy that people can also listen to one of the discussions that we have since yeah i kind of like it that it was not really uh scripted right it's a free, like a free discussion about the topics that we're thinking perhaps it brings also some interesting ideas into people how our minds work when we are together interacting yes. with two, two, two uh, crazy scientists <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah i think there's a lot of implications of how you talk and what you talk about as a scientist that might be interesting or, or not and if it's not then people find another podcast <laughs> <laughs> great all right Thank you so much, uh, Samo, and uh, hope to see you soon, uh, if not uh, uh, before World of Coffee. So thank you so much and have a great day and take care. Thank you, Morten, you too, and have a great day. Thank you. Uh, Bye.